the name of this forum is Behind the Housing Crisis, the Roots of Gentrification and Displacement in California. Now, there are many important events in the Bay Area on policy solutions to the housing crisis and debates about what can be done or lifting up the experiences of people impacted by the crisis. We want to do in this, what we want to do in this event is to take a step back and look at the social, political, and economic structures that have shaped and continue to shape housing in the region and across California. We are especially interested in understanding how these structural forces of racialized inequality, and ineffective and unresponsive government, and marginalized and divided communities have created and perpetuated the housing crisis. We hope this is e that this event lifts up an analysis in a way that contributes to changing some of the dominant narrative about how we got into the predicament we're in. The event tonight is sponsored by the House Institute and Causa Justice Just Cause. The House Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society at UC Berkeley supports research to generate specific prescriptions for change and policy and practice that address disparities related to race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, disability, and socioeconomics in California and nationwide. The Institute brings together researchers, community stakeholders, policymakers, and communicators to identify and challenge the barriers to an inclusive, just, and sustainable society and create transformative change been in existence for just about almost at, over two years now, right, John? Yeah. Uh, Causa Who Suggests Cause is a grassroots community-based organization that organizes to improve conditions in Latino and black neighborhoods in Oakland and in San, in San Francisco, and to contribute to building the larger multiracial, multigenerational movement for justice and fundamental change. The organization was instrumental in the passage of over a dozen tenant rights organizations in the two cities. And the Tenants Rights Clinic serves more than a thousand tenants each year. And Causa Husta also ran foreclosure clinics, fighting back big banks and winning reprieves for dozens of homeowners. Causa Husta Just Cause has also fought deportation of a from our immigrant communities winning sanctuary cities in both San Francisco and Oakland, and later helping to get motions passed by both counties pledging due process and non-cooperation with ICE on immigration holes. And I've worked, uh, when I was at Baja, I worked very closely with Causa Husta, and I have a lot of respect for the organization and for its executive director. Uh, so that's the two organizations that are sponsoring this event. Uh, now I want to just say a little bit about the speakers that we have tonight, and then we'll get right into the program. Uh, I'm going to introduce them in the order that they're going to be speaking. Maria Poblet is the executive director of Causa Who's to Just Cause. She is Chicana and Argentine with extensive experience in Latino community organizing, connecting the provision of services to organizing and leadership development. Under her leadership, Causa Who's to Just Cause addresses racialized displacement and has earned a number of awards, including the Pat Patino Moore Legacy Award for breaking down barriers between Latinos and African American communities and building a national movement to ensure the well-being of all American families. She also serves in the leadership of the U.S. Social Forum and the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance and is a founder of the U.S. chapter of the World March of Women. Richard Walker is Professor Emeritus in the Geography Department at UC Berkeley. Richard Walker is a widely recognized expert in, on California, a major economic, political, and cultural heart of world capitalism. He, ex he has explored the state's economic development, natural resources, racial conflict, and political upheavals. An enduring thread of Professor Walker's thought is the logic of capitalism as an economic, political, and social system and its geographic evolution. He has authored several recent articles and papers on the financial crisis and the Great Recession of the 2000s and on the housing crisis. He is currently working on a new book about the San Francisco Bay Area called City at Bay. And finally, we have John A. Powell. 
who is the executive director of the Haas Institute. In addition to being professor of law and professor of African American studies and ethnic studies at UC Berkeley, uh, Professor Ho Powell holds the Robert D. Haas Chancellor's Chair in Equity and Inclusion. He has been a leader in developing what is an opportunity-based housing model that provides a critical and creative framework for thinking about affordable housing, racialized space, and the many ways that housing influence other opportunity domains, including education, health, and health care, and employment. He is the author of several books, including his most recent work, Racing to Justice, Transforming Our Concept of Self and Other to Build an Inclusive Society. So those are our three very dynamic and very experienced uh, speakers. So get ready for a treat. I'm going to ask Marie Poblet to start us off. Thank you. It feels like a really important moment to understand what's happening. And I'll be honest, I don't think I understand everything that's happening and I think it's gonna take a little while to make sense of the political moment. And at the same time, there's things that we know and that we've known for a while and, and that are affirmed by uh, the political moment. Um, the crisis of gentrification and displacement is what the Bay Area is known for. Anywhere you go, you can tell them, tell somebody, oh, I'm from the Bay Area, and they'll be like, how do you <laughs> afford to live there? And I tell them I live in a co-op, um, and I'm grateful for the people who started it in the 80s. And um, this is a definitive fight of our time, and I've been through several waves of gentrification. Um, I came to political work in the 90s in the Mission District and we were part of creating the Mission Anti-Displacement Coalition and it was the first of many waves of the pattern that we can describe of how working class communities are being pulled out from the urban center, moved out to the edges, and really there's a pattern of resegregation happening in the Bay Area, which is a ground zero for that particular manifestation of what really is just neoliberal development. That's how it works. That's one of the, the patterns that it relies on for making profit. And those are, our, those are the families that we work with at Causa Justa, those people who get pushed out, who then have to take a maybe three modes of transportation to get back to San Francisco to clean a hotel room, maybe for a living wage, which maybe covers transportation. That's, um, it's a crisis in our communities and other people have spoken very well to the level of the crisis. Um, there's tons of statistics about it. They're extremely depressing. And does anybody need some? Because I do have some. <laughs> No? Okay. It's profoundly racialized, right? You have black communities and black neighborhoods serving the role of the canary in the coal mine of neoliberal development, right? Black communities are getting pushed out first and most brutally. Latino communities, often uh, recent migrants that we work with, are coming into what were historically black neighborhoods or maybe still are black neighborhoods to fight for their family stability and find what's left of affordable housing and they find themselves, these communities, often pitted against each other at the bottom of the housing market, at the bottom of the employment market and what that creates is an opportunity to form new alliances. If you look at it structurally, if you look at neoliberalism and neoliberal urban development then you can look at what the communities have in common, how uh, immigrant Latino communities were first displaced from their countries. Uh, when we started our immigrant organizing work, uh, we had always organized immigrants actually around housing and the mission, but our immigrant rights policy work, and the, what eventually became the Sanctuary City Ordinance, the second one, because the first one was um, in the 80s, 
was because there was a raid in the in a hotel that we were organizing, a, a residential hotel, you know, where you pay by the week and you pay basically a lot more than somebody else just because you can't pay a full month in advance. That hotel had a lot of Mayan immigrants in it and ICE came to do a raid in search of the managers of that hotel who were South Asian and they found some of them and they grabbed some of the tenants that we had been working with to demand an improvement in the conditions of, of the hotel. And that led us to start the immigrant rights organizing work and it led us to connect local and global displacement in our thinking because they were already connected in our experience um, but to start to connect them in our thinking. And we wanted to change the whole world. We were going to end displacement. We had um, flyers that talked about from Palestine to the mission, uh, criminalization and displacement. And we were working with like 40 people at a time. We had maybe 400 members. We were doing our meetings in Spanish only and in one neighborhood. And eventually we had to come to grips with the difference between our vision and our impact. And this led us to a merger with Just Cause Oakland that was instrumental to creating the first tenant protections in Oakland to form a black and brown unity organization really looking at power building and looking at black and Latino communities not as the victims of urban development but as the political protagonists of history. And the, using an inside-outside strategy, meaning direct action, community organizing, one-on-one uh, -on -one case counseling, and fighting landlords tooth and nail. These two right there do it every day. Give it up for them. <laughs> it's hard work. It's hard work. And it's outside work. There aren't structures built in society that help you do that. There are structures built in the movement now, and that's awesome. Um, and then inside strategies creating electoral coalitions, um, being involved not on Causa Justa time, in electoral campaigns, radicalizing elected officials and, and trying to elect radicals, which we should probably try to do now again and more. <laughs> and, um, and the vision that comes from our communities is this one of protagonism, of political protagonism, because a lot of the way that um, we talk about the problems of gentrification are about, I don't know, in Spanish you call them the pobrecitos, the story like, oh, it's so hard. It's so hard to be pushed out, and it is. It's, it's hard, it's brutal suffering, and it ruins people's lives. Also, in the middle of that, people are changing policy on behalf of everybody else. Measure JJ in Oakland now protects probably a bunch of you, and it was created by black grandmas and Latina domestic workers. So give it up for them. <laughs> and this is, I think, some of, as we take stock of this political moment, some of what we have that we can build on. We have this strength in the Bay Area of um, organizations, networks, individuals, movements that want to work together. We have, as weak as they are, and as we want them to be much stronger, but we have some tenant protections that we have won. We have cities that identify as sanctuary, whether they function as one is a different thing. And sanctuary shouldn't just be a policy, it should be a way of living in community and a way of resisting. We can build on those strengths in this political moment. We can have and create cities where we belong and cities that belong to us. And us meaning all of us. Everybody who's feeling targeted in this moment in all these different ways, now is the time to come together. And this DNA of coming together, this practice that we have, it just needs to grow and reach scale. This is the time. Because there's a lot of kind of broke ideas that have been uh, letting us down and pulling us away from struggle. One of them is trickle-down economics. It's everywhere in the housing, discussions about housing, right? If you just build some condos, then the gentrals will go live in those, and then you can keep your crap-ass apartment, you know? Since when? <laughs> Since when do people with a lot of money self-select the most expensive apartment and leave you alone? That's not how it works. It's not about individual consumption. 
And you can't build your way out of the crisis. Even if you built all the affordable housing units that you could at this moment, it would not cover the need that we have in our communities. And it wouldn't regulate the market. And if we don't regulate the market, it's going to continue working like it has been, which is to push our people out and to make a lot of money in that process. Um, another idea that's really at the movement level that I think we need to challenge is that we sort of fetishize marginalization. We have shaped ourselves, and I say we because it's me and many people I have worked with, through the struggles that were about how we were being left out, how we were being pushed out, how uh, racism, classism, homophobia, how capitalism was pushing us into the margins and, and what that meant for us. The challenge is instead of viewing that experience as the place of power, to view that experience as the place from which we gain perspective and build power, build power with each other. Because so many people are marginalized by the system. In fact, a bunch of people who didn't think they were lost their homes in the foreclosure crisis. And all of a sudden, they became members of Casa Lista, where before they'd be like, well, that's for poor people, and I'm not poor. <laughs> And how, there's so many sectors of society that are having that experience right now. Oh yeah, well, I guess, no, but I had my say because I have the right to vote, and how did that work out for you? Um, it's, um, it's time for a majoritarian movement, and it's time to build that movement from the perspective of these marginalized communities, from the perspective of communities of color, of women, of queer people, these communities can and have led majoritarian movements here. And it's, it's like this much, right? But we've, so we've started to build the muscle that we need to throw the punches that are going to be required in the next period. The, um, the experience of passing Measure JJ in Oakland was humongous. The experience of expanding the sanctuary and whoop, calling it in San Francisco due process so that it reflected more of the values and the experiences that were important in, our, in the black community that was being targeted and criminalized too and not being offered sanctuary by, any, by anybody. Um, these are the experiences that we can build on in this next period. The, the role that organizations play is both to aggregate the power of individual people who are facing a crisis and to build our revolutionary imagination because, my God, don't we need to be able to imagine something better like right now? I mean, I needed to fall asleep at night right now. And um, organizations are how we're going to make that, how we're going to make that change because the forces of gentrification and displacement are highly organized. They have committees. They have uh, elected uh, officers. They have people in city government. They have people at the state government. They have people running foundations. And we uh, who care about social justice, we who want an alternative to neoliberal urban development, who don't buy trickle-down economics, we need organizations. We need organizations like Causa Justa. We need organizations like the ones that are being imagined in some of your heads right now that are going to be important in the next period. And we need, um, we need rebel cities. We need to push our cities not just to have a sanctuary ordinance on paper and then behind closed doors argue about who is deserving of sanctuary and who is not but to stand up to the federal government as it confronts um, immigrant communities with more and more criminalization, as it devalues black life, as it attacks women. We need cities that will represent the people in them. We need uh, cities where we all belong and cities that belong to us. And I hope that this is just the beginning of a conversation about how we get there. Because some of what we have done in the last period is what we need to scale up to do that. And we're going to have to do new things. We're going to have to be uncomfortable. We're going to have to form new alliances. We're going to have to take risks. And I would like to um, end with a quote from Galeano, because I was 
I didn't want to just end with the question around values that prevent us um, from doing what we need to do because there's also values that we have <coughs> that are going to take us where we need to go. And uh, Eduardo Galeano says, at first glance, the world appears to be a multitude of bunched up solitude, everyone against everyone, every man for himself. But the sense of commonality, the sense of community, is a bug that's hard to kill. Hope still has those who await it, encouraged by the voices that echo from our common origin, and by the amazing spaces where we come together. I don't know of a greater fortune than the joy of recognizing myself in others. It may be, for me, the only immortality worthy of faith. Recognizing myself in others, recognizing myself in my country and in the time I live in, and also recognizing myself in women and men who are my compatriots born in other lands, and recognizing myself in women and men who are my contemporaries who lived in other times. The maps of the soul have no borders. Thank you, Maria, that was inspiring. I, I want us to hold on to a couple of points that Maria made in her presentation. One is we need cities where we belong and cities that belong to us. Uh, and also the point that she made that the housing crisis is symptomatic of a larger crisis, a society-wide crisis. Uh, and uh, I think our next two speakers are gonna expound upon those two points. So I'm gonna invite Dick Walker to come to the podium. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, Eli. Thanks, everyone who's organized this event and for inviting me. Very happy to be here. And what I, my role here, I think, is to do a little political economy. I'm an academic, so that's what I do best. And what I want to do is to critique the kind of naturalized view of housing and property markets, that somehow they work and somehow they're correct and fair and well-behaved and therefore we should all come be um, under their sway. And those on the right who argue that, you know, we're just bitching and moaning about things that can't be stopped are actually wrong. <clears throat> and they misunderstand the very thing they think they know. So I'm gonna very quickly give you my riff on why uh, the conventional wisdom is wrong. And this is my little outline. And I'll give you some numbers, I'll give you some graphs, because graphs are always fun, at least I think they're fun, which may show what a distorted sense of reality I have. <laughs> and then uh, my argument is really, uh, has two parts, and one is that the real problem of the housing market is bloated demand. Um, it's also complemented by the fact that the supply side of the market doesn't work very well and never has. And then I'll say a little bit about uh, the politics of this and solutions. So um, I'll just run through these guys and I think they're fairly self-explanatory. First of all, uh, behind the first thing behind the housing crisis is the tech boom. This is the world center of tech, as we all know. Um, and it's an unbelievable kind of explosion of this industry. And I'm not going to go into critique of tech, because that would be a whole nother lecture. But let's assume that industry wants to be here. It wants to cluster mostly in the West Bay, Silicon Valley, San Francisco. And um, the uh, rate of increase of employment in the last five years, six years in the Bay Area is astounding. And the rate of increase of growth of these companies and their profitability um, is even more astounding. And behind that, you can see in this graph on the left that, um, which is really helpful because it's San Francisco's rents graphed against the NASDAQ. 
And the NASDAQ is the Dow Jones Index for tech companies. And as the NASDAQ goes, as the tech companies go, so go the rent in San Francisco. And that one only goes up to uh, 2013. And you can see the bubble of the 90s is really dramatic. And if the graph continued on the right, it's going to look about as dramatic. Um, question is, is this just the tech industry or is there something else going on? And I'm going to come back to this argument later, but just to show you a couple of graphs. Uh, I don't know why I've separated graphs from the argument, but there it is. Um, you can, the San Francisco offices, it's not just housing. San Francisco offices are now cost more per square foot than Manhattan. And if you look at this other graph on the right, it's complementary to the NASDAQ graph because it's about venture capital and venture capital versus San Francisco office rents. And you can see how closely they track. <clears throat> Houses. If you were going to buy a house in the Bay Area, this graph shows uh, all, nine county, all nine counties. San Francisco, of course, on top. Um, and I think on the bottom is Contra Costa. But they're all high, rising, uh, had a peak. Of course, a housing peak is even, it, it didn't so much peak in the 90s, but in the 2000s in the great housing bubble. And you can see it's come back and gotten worse. And so the average house in the Bay Area is around $700,000. And in San Francisco is about a million and a quarter, which means it costs more than a castle. I'll tell you a little story, a friend of mine uh, it was in France, and she decided to look on the Craigslist of France to see how much a chateau costs. And she found like a, I don't know, 60 room chateau, which only cost about $750,000. So you could get that in France for what it costs for a rather modest house in the Marina District. Whoops. Um, but the, and the housing has only gotten worse, and the Bay Area is the worst of the worst. So the Bay Area's median house prices are about four times the national average. California as a whole is about twice the national average. And you can see the national average has been creeping up there, but that's San Francisco at the top, just San Francisco, and then California average in the middle, and you can see how out of proportion this is to the rest of the country and really out of proportion to almost anywhere else. Probably the most expensive housing in the country and some of the most expensive in the world. Rents, of course, are about the same. Uh, the bubbles haven't been as exaggerated yet, but you can see that the rents are climbing higher now than they were in uh, the, the 1990s dot-com bubble and are at astronomic levels, uh, aided no doubt by the fact that people are priced out of the housing market and they're, st they're renting. Plus, the tech industry brings in a lot of young people who are renting and so on. So the average rent in San Francisco is one of the highest. It's one of the, probably one of the four most unaffordable cities in the, in the world. And here's just a, a graph showing the different uh, counties, starting with San Francisco down. And then this one in the right corner for you Oaklanders, that's Oakland which seems so much lower than San Francisco, except you'll notice it's catching up because as the rents have charged up in the West Bay, uh, it spreads out, it's like lifting up a tent and it just spreads out. And as you know, people are pushed out to the East Bay and then pushed out to the far uh, inner suburb, outer suburbs and the Central Valley and beyond. This is a graph of affordability going back to 1991. And you can see that it hovers around average for the Bay Area of about 20% of the households can afford the median house. And that's really bad. And in booms, it goes even lower, goes down closer to 10%. So again, people, we have, this is a rich place. There are actually, the average wage is rather high, I'll come back to this, but people still can't afford houses. I know I'm preaching to the converted here, but uh, it's nice to see it in numbers. So let me talk about market failure. The ideal model says that demand is, supply is going to adjust to demand, that demand is a given, and therefore the market is good, the market is flexible, the market is fair. 
and none of those things are true. Housing markets are probably the worst, most ill-behaved market. They do not behave like iPhones or something that's a, a nice mass-produced item. Uh, they just don't work like that. And my argument is that demand is really bloated. Supply is a dull blade to the scissors, the great scissors of the market. And that place matters and people matter. And that's not in the model at all. So let's talk about money, about bloated demand. First of all, this is the richest place, the richest metropolis in the United States, and probably the richest per capita in the world. It vies with places like Singapore on that, on that basis. Um, so this is a very wealthy place, just as my next point, of course. It isn't distributed evenly. But the fact that it's so rich with this booming economy has just driven demand, housing, uh, right through the roof. We also, of course, one of the great, the tech industry is one of the great producers of inequality. So when you talk about the growing gap, uh, wealth and income inequality in America, the tech industry is one of the key creators of that. It creates unbelievable amounts of wealth for the 1%, plus extraordinarily high salaries for the top 20%. We have more billionaires and millionaires per capita than any place else on Earth. Um, but at the bottom, and the average working families earn, OK, maybe a little higher than they do in Atlanta, but not high enough to afford these rents that are basically determined in the central city, in the West Bay, in favored parts of the East Bay, are determined by these incredibly wealthy and well-paid people. And a third of the people in the Bay Area, the workers in the Bay Area, are low-wage workers. And a quarter only earn the minimum wage or worse. So although averages, people will tell you, oh, well, you know, we're a very wealthy place. And you say, OK, fine. But averages are statistics that lie. Now, the other thing that nobody talks about, and it just drives me nuts, OK? Because I think most of you understand that tech and the Bay Area is rich, and that that's a driver here. Inequality is a serious, serious problem in our time and getting worse. Uh, but people don't talk that much about credit and investment. And it seems odd in the wake of the housing bubble of the 2000s that blew up so spectacularly in 2007 and 8 that we would not talk about that again today. <clears throat> there is enormous amounts of funny money and a fictitious capital, if you want to be fancy, or simply frenzied finance, if you like uh, alliteration, <laughs> that is flowing around the world for a variety of reasons. But world capitalism is actually not doing that well right now. The growth rates are crappy pretty much everywhere. Places like Europe is stagnant. Um, even the US isn't doing that great, despite what you might hear. And there's a lot of money. And that's why it's all parked in the Bahamas. It's not just to avoid taxes. It's also because they don't know what to do with it. And so what they do with it, a lot of them, is park it in cities. They invest in tech. They, they join risk capital groups and invest in venture capital funds. And unbelievable billions of dollars flow into this area from all over the world in directly into the tech industry and indirectly into the housing industry. So you get phenomenon like, I, I mean, it's very hard to get the figures on this. But back in the dot-com bubble, after that exploded, I did get figures. The NASDAQ, which led the biggest um, stock market bubble in the history of the world up to that time, which the, the stock, went up, stock market went up about $17 trillion worth in the 90s. And about seven trillion of that, or about 40% of it, was invested in tech companies. So you hear about venture capital, but that NASDAQ, that investment, stock investment, was an order of magnitude greater. That meant 40% of all that wealth in all the stock markets in the US was going directly to the Bay Area and its companies. Well, you think that didn't exaggerate demand? Well, yeah, and when it blew up, when it popped, those companies, their values fell, in many cases, by over 90%. So 
So, oh, that couldn't be happening again. <laughs> unicorn, you've heard the unicorns? A couple of dozen, three dozen of these things worth billions. If you didn't start, have a startup that's worth a billion dollars, you're nothing over in tech land. There's a lot of bloat over there. And then on top of it, in the housing markets, there are all, there's all kinds of billions of dollars flooding in through mortgage money. Interest rates have been very low. We, uh, California uh, uh, is a quarter of all the mortgages. Mortgage value in the United States in recent years is in California. That props up very, very high property values, ability to buy houses at very high values. And then you get, in addition, things like uh, the Saudi fund that just put a billion dollars in this online bank, whatever it's called, can't remember the name of it, which has suddenly gone into home lending. Or the fact that California has more of these shady non-bank banks than any place in the United States right now, many of them created by this <coughs> son of a bitch Mnuchin, who's just going to be appointed Treasury Secretary, who's one of the sleaze balls of all time. <coughs> And he's the one who bought, uh, I think it was IndyMac, no, Countrywide Savings or IndyMac, one of those banks that blew up the housing market in California, which we specialized in in that bubble. And then the same guys, he and this other guy's call, guy called Mozilla, come back, buy, uh, rebuy these banks, and then buy up foreclosed homes, and which they then rent out. So these are total sleaze bags, and they're have huge amounts of money flooding in to their operations going, again, into home loans. OK, so that's my argument about that. I could go on and on. Um, on the supply side, the fact is that supply doesn't respond well. <clears throat> Buildings are big, lumpy things. Cities are difficult. Spaces that are already occupied, that have buildings. Uh, you don't just crank out buildings and new apartments and new houses willy-nilly. <clears throat> and one of the things you see because of that, <clears throat> because of that time lag, is that building cycles are extremely pronounced. And this is something that's been known by economists for years, but ordinary economists and, and housing advocates, uh, you know, the ones who say just build at all costs, uh, don't, don't seem to remember. So you get these fantastic peaks, and then it collapses. And it's interesting because when the, the bubble collapses, prices do go down. But it doesn't do much good to the people who've already been forced out of their homes and priced out of their neighborhoods. And they, of course, are priced out because the rich get first choice. And you've got boodles of rich people and well-paid people. They are bidding for the housing that's forcing people out of San Francisco, out of Oakland now, and out of the Central Bay Area. And the idea is that somehow people should just adjust to this, but I, you know better than I that that's not how life works in the city. And of course, uh, there are additional problems, which is that the landlords, if people won't move, landlords are very good at taking advantage of the fact they're going to make more money if they evict them, and you get mass evictions, which we've experienced. Builders don't want to build for ordinary working people. They want to build for richer people because they make more money. And so, and we have no federal housing policy except to support well-to-do people's private housing purchases. So uh, the, the result is that the market does not work for working people. It works for the elite who have money, and that's kind of, as you know, the way capitalism works. So I will just wrap up here, because I'm going on too long, that um, there is a battle over this. And we know, I mean, Just Cause is just one of many groups um, that are fighting for the rights of tenants. Uh, these are po extremely politically charged issues about building more housing, evictions, and displacement. What's interesting um, is that the conservative argument says, well, it's all a problem of restricted supply because you opponents are getting in the way of the market's natural ability to build houses. But that's crazy, because there is no naturally smooth market. 
we have cities are where we live and people care about their neighborhoods, their lives in neighborhoods, and of course they fight for that. What's interesting is all the, all the criticism goes against people like you in this audience who are fighting for tenants' rights, and almost none of it goes against all those rich people who defend their neighborhoods like crazy and have much more power and much more success in doing so, and who lock up tremendous amounts of land and space in places like Atherton and Lafayette and will not let any rental housing in at all. So who's really the barrier here? And I'll just finish on the final thing that a lot of this, of course, solving this problem is beyond local government and local movements. Much as I love them and much as they're important to kind of get in the way and slow, put a monkey wrench in the gears of this overheated market. That's a good thing, and most of what tenants' rights groups and so on are doing is exactly what they should be doing. But of course, at a larger scale, we really need to deal with the frenzied finance, the stagnancy of capitalism, and taxing the wealthy, taxing the corporations, getting taxing their Bahamian uh, bank accounts, and also raising the wages of ordinary working people. And that's all that's going to solve the housing crisis, ultimately. Thanks. Frenzy finance, I like alliteration. Uh, thank you. Uh, you have illuminated for us how the system is rigged. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to ask John Powell to come forward and uh, tell us a little bit more about how the system is rigged and how we can uh, Unrig it, if you will. John Powell. Good evening. So the system was already rigged, it just got more rigged. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what you might do, but just sort of the big note, right, is to, um, I'll see her here, I'm looking for my daughter. Oh, there she is. Uh, Sunita's in the back, work on housing. Um, so she just sent me this thing by one of the founders of Occupy. He makes the observation that sovereignty comes through two mechanisms, you may agree or disagree, but he says the two mechanisms are war and politics. And he says, you know, the war is kind of messy. So what about politics? So that's where I'll start, is that uh, we just had an election of a sort. Um, <laughs> and um, around the country, I would say, those of us who consider ourselves on the left, uh, we did not engage in sophisticated politics. What, the art, uh, what this talk is, is, is called how the Occupy movement was a constructive failure. Some of you may know it's the biggest movement in the last 20 years, bigger than the Tea Party, bigger than Black Lives Matters. It didn't have political consequences of great significance. Um, and this is what the founder of Occupy, one of the founders of Occupy is saying. And basically saying, we didn't engage in politics. Um, and we stood and critiqued the political system, which is appropriate, but we didn't engage in changing it. We thought movement itself, protest itself, was enough. It's not. Um, I can say a lot more about that, but that's not what I'm supposed to be talking about. Uh, but if that's how the system gets rigged. The system is made through politics. Uh, and the financial market is made through politics. And if we're going to change it, we have to change our engagement in politics and the way politics work. Um, and some of this is also implicated with narratives. Uh, and I've said a number of times, the issue for the 21st century, if Du Bois says uh, race is the issue, uh, the color line is the issue of the 19th and 20th century, I would say the process of othering is the issue of the 21st century. Now, if you think about othering, and you think about neoliberalism, uh, neoliberalism is a global phenomenon. And neoliberalism teeters all around the globe toward neo-fascism um, animated 
by the crisis of othering. So we have large populations coming to a place where they are considered quote unquote other. Uh, you have almost a perfect storm uh, um, with neoliberalism taking all the spoils and then the other coming into the homeland and becoming a useful charge for attacking politics and neoliberalism. So, and the others will be different in different countries in the United States. And it's not one other, right? I mean, Trump was very clear. Who are the others? He said, have a long list of others. Uh, if you're black, you're other. If you're from Mexico, you're other. If you're gay, you're other. If you have a disability, you're other. If you're a woman, you're other. If you're not a white, Christian, conservative man, you're other. Uh, now, one of the things that's interesting about Trump is that what he did, he didn't just play off of those fears and anxiety. He took the anxiety about othering, which happens almost naturally. If you go through a, uh, a marriage, change where you live, and change your job, within two years, you increase the chance of a heart attack by almost 50%. Now, those are good things. Uh, presumably, if you're marrying the right person, <laughs> uh, you get the right job. But the point is, is that we actually have a hard time as an organism processing change. Um, and so the way we process change is we don't actually figure it out on our own. So it's not simply that all these people are racist, homophobic, misogynistic, whatever. Is that you actually have leadership and narrative helping people to make sense of the world as it's changing. Uh, so if you look at the first box, it's about increased demographics. And, uh, and which is been, we've been talking about for a long time. And if you look at anxiety in America, and we can do this empirically, anxiety in America in virtually every population has been going up. So at a conscious level, we say, oh, great, you know, we're not going to have a majority white country anymore. That's what we're saying consciously. And the unconscious is saying, oh my, how did this happen? Uh, can't we go back to something when we were? Um, and so this anxiety is there. Anxiety is actually not good or bad, it just is. Think of your, if you have children, a five-year-old gets ready to go to school. It's a change. How do I process that change? And they're talking to their parents and they say, first day of school tomorrow, Alma? And you say, and what should I expect? You say, oh, there are going to be bullies there. <laughs> Someone's going to try to take your lunch money. Uh, it's like, I don't want to go to school, I don't want to school. Uh, so that's one story. And that's a, what we call a breaking story. That's a story where the other is a threat. That's a win-lose story, uh, where we learn to hate, we learn to fear the other. Uh, the other story is, you're going to go to school tomorrow. Oh, what should I expect? You're going to make new friends. You're going to have play dates. You're going to go to the park. Yay! Uh, that's a bridging story, where the other actually enhances who we are. Uh, and this question about othering and belonging is ultimately about a question at the ontological level. It's not the same as the question of what we have. And so sometimes we want to collapse. You know, we talk about, I talk about the self happening on three multiple levels. Economic level, which we more or less understand. The political level, power level, which we sort of understand politics. But the third level is who we are. And who we are is also defined on who belongs and who does not belong. And that's the level that we on the left have a hard time with because we think it's soft and you know, it's too fuzzy. We like hard materialists. Um, but who we are, people's sense of who we are collectively is extremely important. Now it's more grounded in traditional religious discourse and spiritual discourse than it is in, is in economics discourse. We're not good with religion or spirituality. Uh, so we keep saying, you know, all these white folks was losing their jobs, and, and that's why they voted for Donald Trump. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, you see the issue of othering, and it's challenged to neoliberalism happening all over the world. It's not tracked by economic dislocation. The United States, States is not Germany in the 1930s. We're not going through large economic dislocation. And we say, well, well what about all the inequality? Okay, so we care about inequality. So why vote for Trump? He just told you he's going to give you more inequality. 
He's going to create more billionaires. He's going to lower. The, he's going to reduce all the regulations. He's going to go back to the before 2007. So if you're really concerned about inequality, Trump's not your man. Why is Trump your man? Because he organizes around a conservative white identity. And I'll just say one more thing about this, and this is, I'm way off of script, I'll just tell you. Uh, <laughs> for those who say, yes, we need to move beyond identity politics, and I've written this, uh, and I said, you know, it, what does that mean? And usually what they mean is that if black people and gays and queers just stop bellyaching, we could get back to the real issue of creating jobs for the white working class. <laughs> right? So in that formulation, what we're really saying is the only identity that matters in identity politics are white working class. Uh, and what Trump was able to do is create more coherency around whiteness than we were around progressiveness. So he created bridging among whites, and we created breaking among progressives. Uh, that's a problem. As long as that happens, we lose. So the dominant narrative in our society is all about race, is all about individualism. Um, and the individualism and race and markets gets translated into government. And so the housing market is a deeply heavy, heavily regulated market. Uh, even the credit market. Now you may say, well, credit market certainly is not regulated. It is regulated. It's just not regulated for us. It's not a question of regulated or not regulated. It's like regulated for whom? It's regulated for the rich. You can't have an unregulated market. So when a tech company goes to China and they say, China's still in our stuff, they don't say, let's have an unregulated market. They say, that's not fair. We call it intellectual capital. They're not playing by the rules. And the Chinese say, we didn't make the rules. Those are your rules. And those same companies that actually say we want an unregulated market come back to the United States government saying, they're not playing fair in China. Will you help us? Will you regulate in our behalf? But if you say, we'd like you to pay some taxes, they say, we let the market figure it out. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's uneven. So the reality is, we want to move to a more effective government. Now, we haven't had an effective government that's been inclusive, never in the history of the United States, never. There are times the government has worked very well, but only for a captured market. And in some sense, you could say, all the stuff that we're going, around, don't do, going over right now is really an attack on the New Deal corrected by the Johnson administration. The New, New Deal government worked extremely well in terms of starting to organize capital in the markets, but it said there's some people that we actually need to leave out of this arrangement. Who are those people? Blacks, Latinos, women, we're not even talking about gays. So it left out the same people that are protesting to get in. And Johnson, in the 1960s, said, OK, let's try to correct that. And that's when the, the sort of consensus around the New Deal started coming apart. Uh, now, the attack was not named the New Deal. The attack said, it's government. Government has been captured by, as Reagan said, special interests. So how do we now attack government? And we said we want a small government, but really what we wanted was a government that switched sides. Now, governments start to work for people. That's not the kind of government we want in a neoliberal society. We want a government that works for the market. And expressions of redlining, government action. Uh, and the move, the effort to make government more responsive has actually been uneven. We tried, the Black Panther Party said, how do we make the police more responsive? You know, sort of interesting, Black Panther Party came out of Oakland, you know, Gus was here when I was happening, I was here. Uh, they had a problem. It's a problem we've never heard of before or since. It was called police brutality. <laughs> police was killing people. And so what did the Panthers do? Now just as a footnote, 
Now, they couldn't do a hashtag, because it was before a hashtag. They picked up a gun. They said, we're going to police the police, police in the black community. And for all the Second Amendment people now, it was like, hell no, black people with guns? <laughs> so what I'm saying is that they were trying to make government more responsive. Now, so here's a revolutionary group. They had problems, I will admit that. But they also ran for school board. They understood that you had to have politics. It was Malcolm X who said the ballot or the bullet. He didn't just say the bullet, he said the ballot or the bullet. And so if we look at our revolutionary movements before, they've always understood that capturing the instrumentality of government and making it more responsive is part of the agenda. So as California has become more diverse, not just here in California, but all of, all of the country, you've had increased anxiety all over the country. Now again, that anxiety can be shaped through many different stories. The early story was just what a colleague and friend, Ian Henny Lopez, called dog whistle politics. You sort of talked about the welfare cheats. You talked about the government being inappropriate because it's helping the unresponsive. You talk about the takers and the makers. And so the attack on government and the attack on redistribution through taxes like Prop 13 was really saying government is working for people who really aren't people, who really don't belong. Prop 13 was as much about Latinos coming into the school system as it was about taxes. There's a book called Other People's Children. You shouldn't have to be taxed <laughs> to pay for other people's children to go to school. Now you can't say that directly, or you couldn't before Trump ran, now you can say it directly, uh, <laughs> but you have to code it, and the code was a dog whistle. And the goal was to how to make government bankrupt so it couldn't afford investing in people. Um, now Richard just basically shared that California uh, sixth largest country in the world in terms of economic power, more billionaires, more money, and it can't pay for our schools, it can't pay for our roads, it can't pay for housing. How can that be? How can such a rich place be so broke? Uh, and so it's very good at accumulating huge amount of wealth for the 0.1%, but very bad at helping farm workers, helping the black community, helping renters. Because in a sense, the government is not responsive to us. It has switched sides. Um, and all of these things, when we think about segregation laws. And some people today, especially whatever, will say, you know, well, why is it, you know, you don't, you know, forget about addressing segregation. We can just have all black communities and all white communities. It's a point of clarification. Segregation was never about black and white, Latino, age. It was always about the way we arrange resources. So when a community is segregated, when they said it's all white communities segregated, they're segregated away, but they're not really segregated because opportunity is there. Segregation is about opportunity segregation. Manuel Pastor did a big study like, where do they put the toxic dump sites in the United States? There's a high correlation between toxic dump sites and black and Latino community. <coughs> incarceration is another example. And incarceration is not just locking up black and brown people, because if you look at where incarceration happens, it's not evenly distributed in the United States. It actually happens in certain discrete communities. It's geographically coded. So I want to get to some solutions, and I have one minute. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to take two. Uh, first of all, the housing system has become hopelessly complicated. This was the housing system from the 1930s and up until about the 1970s. It was a two-party system, and then it became three, uh, where either you buy from a bank, uh, and then you buy from a bank, and the bank bundles it and sells it, so it became a three-party system. That was what we had uh, for about 50 years. And then with securitization, 
we end up having this system. Now, if you can understand this system, you are singular. The head of the Federal Reserve Board basically said he didn't understand, this is before uh, Yeltsin became head, he said he didn't understand how the housing market worked. Because the housing market is not only hopelessly complicated, it's also, as Richard suggested, a profoundly complicated credit market. We're not talking about bricks and mortar, we're talking about moving trillions of dollars around the globe in big numbers. Uh, now, when the subprime crisis happened and affected the black and Latino community big time, the response was, let's educate these people about the housing market. Quick, quick thing. Goldman Sachs told some banks that it wanted subprime loans, a, bun a bunch of them. They wanted billions of dollars of subprime loans. It was going to bundle those loans and turn them into securities and sell them on the market. Only wanting subprime loans, not prime loans. Prime loans are supposed to be safer. They wanted subprime loans because they could charge more and make more money off of it. When uh, the bank, so they got the loans, they sent it to their uh, people to write up so, as securities to sell it on the market. When they got the prospectus back, which described uh, the loan, they looked at it and they said, this is not a good perspective. What's wrong with this perspective? If people read this perspective, they'll understand what's happening. <laughs> they sent it back to some theoretical mathematicians and theoretical physicists to put it into an algorithm that no one could understand. They said, this is the kind of perspective we need. They then took that perspective and sold those securities on Wall Street. And then they bet that the securities would fail. They took out insurance, betting that these securities that they were producing and selling would fail. And when they did fail, they made billions and billions of dollars. Now here's the rub. The Justice Department then sued first time that the Justice Department ever brought a suit against the secondary market in the history of the country. It sued on behalf of not the black community, not the Latino community, not the poor white community. It sued on behalf of Wall Street investors. <laughs> and actually, I went to the Justice Department and I said, I'm American. You know, like everybody, I care about the poor people on Wall Street, but what about the black and Latino <laughs> homeowners? And the Justice Department said, that's interesting. And they did nothing. My point is, no one said we should provide financial literacy to the investors on Wall Street, <laughs> which is what we get when our communities fail. So quick thing, you have concentrated poverty, big problem. It means you also have concentrated wealth. Um, so I just want to get to some solutions. And the solutions are hard, but not that hard. So and uh, Eli and Sunita and others are working on First of all, you have to have a regional solution. You can't have a local, you don't have a Oakland housing market per se or Richmond. You have a regional housing market, so you need a regional solution. Secondly, you can have a, a bond issue for, um, you know, uh, for housing. It's not going to be enough. Uh, the market is too big. We've empowered it. You've got to make the market do what you want it to do. And so if you say, if you build houses, you've got to build your fair share of affordable housing that's distributed close to opportunity, what I call opportunity-based housing. You say, that's the market. It doesn't cost the taxpayers a penny. You're building housing, you're gonna build, you're gonna build these million dollar homes, five million dollar homes, 12, you're also gonna build houses that will sell for 20 and 30 and 40 thousand dollars. And the market will subsidize itself. They've been doing this for years in New Jersey and Montgomery County. Uh, it doesn't work perfectly, but it works. You make the market do what you need to do. Uh, specialized uh, interest zoning, which they do in Brazil, and new mortgage financing. The point is, is that you have to capture the instrumentality of government, and the government has to tell the market what is what's the outcome is. Uh, and the narrative is not simply you as renters or you as low-income people. Is that you belong. The housing market is something that belongs to the people. In a democratic society, it belongs to everybody. Uh, so that's the thing. Make sure that we build so that uh, everyone belongs. And tell the story that the housing market belongs to everyone. I'll stop by just telling you, in New Jersey, this went to the New Jersey Supreme Court, 
and they were zoning for upscale housing under something in the New Jersey Constitution called the General Welfare Clause. And the New Jersey Supreme Court said, general does not mean rich people. General means everybody. So if you have a housing market, it can't be just for the rich. If you're regulating housing under the General Welfare Clause, you have to include everybody. They did that 40 years ago, and it's still in place. Thank you.